Good day, I'm Norman Walberger from the School of Mathematics and Statistics, Faculty of Science, the University of New South Wales. This is a research snapshot and I want to tell you a little bit about my research in the direction of Diophantine equations, which are equations, like this one here, where we're looking for solutions in natural numbers, or integers, or rational numbers. You go back to Diophantus, mathematician of around 300 AD. And they're notorious for being very difficult to solve. So most of the work that has been done in this direction has uh, focused on specific equations and particular techniques for solving particular equations. I'm rather more interested in my work in trying to tackle the general equation. So a very big equation with lots of variables, possibly. And um, in these two papers, I have laid out a, a method which I call the power method, you'll see why in a little while, uh, that uh, gives us a way of explicitly making some computations using some linear algebra over a finite field or a ring and, uh, and simplifying the equation so we can find often, not always, but sometimes solutions. So the first paper is called a soluble Diophantine equation, which is the first paper I ever wrote as an undergraduate back in 1976, and I have Professor Ed Barbeau of the University of Toronto to thank for encouraging me to, to write that paper. And then many years later, I thought about this subject on and off, and then I wrote this second paper which enlarged and considerably expanded the earlier framework. It's called Row Reduction and Invariance of Diophantine Equations and appeared in the Proceedings of the Indian Academy of Science in 1994. Some years later, a student of mine, Michael Leeming, at the University of New South Wales, created a lovely program that implements this method and that actually allows you to write down a Diophantine equation and input a prime, and then it will solve or try to solve that equation for you using my power method over that prime field. So it's something you can actually test out yourself. It's pretty easy to input an equation and see what happens, and it's interesting. All right, so here's the, the address. You go to that thing and there's a Michael's uh, applet there. You can run it. So let me try to explain very briefly what the general idea is uh, in my approach to solving general Diophantine equations. So because the method is relatively simple and elementary, I can give you a basic idea by looking at an example, and this is the same example that actually appears in my paper. Okay, so let's have a look at this Diophantine equation here. 13x squared y plus 4x to the 4th z cubed plus 5x cubed y to the 5th z to the 6th plus 3y to the 7th z to the 16th is equal to 0, and we're working over, say, the prime p equals 71. So we want to solve this Diophantine equation. We want to find solutions mod 71. Now, of course, since that's just a finite problem, we could get a computer program to run through all the possibilities and just list all the solutions. But this illustrates a more general method that actually gives us more information at the end. All right, so the first thing that I do is I introduce a, another variable, x0, and I multiply all of the terms um, by x0, and I'll rewrite in terms of x1, x2, x3. So there's the same equation, basically, just rewritten now. Uh, in terms of these four variables, x0, x1, x2, x3. And then I'm going to look at this equation, and I'm going to ignore the coefficients. It turns out they're not too important, at least not at the beginning, for the basic idea. What's really important are the various exponents that appear corresponding to each of the terms. And I'm going to record those exponents in, the, in this matrix here, which I call the power matrix of the uh, equation. So this first row corresponds to the terms uh, and their powers of x0. And here we see the powers of x1, 2, 4, 3, and 0, and so on. And because we're working mod 71, these exponents satisfy, because of Fermat's little theorem, that if we add 70 to them, 70 is 71 minus 1, then the, uh, the actual value doesn't change. So these entries are really mod 70, and we're going to be working in this ring, Z70. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to row reduce this matrix. So we can do that. We can row reduce the matrix, and it turns out that we, uh, here's the final result. And here is essentially the matrix uh, that represents the row reduction. So B times A equals C. It's corresponding to the usual kind of linear algebra business, but we're working in Z70. So if we choose this B, we can row reduce this matrix to get this one here. And then the point is that if we cook up a new equation that has this as its power matrix, then the two equations are basically equivalent through a change of variables of a particular kind. So if we introduce four other uh, variables, y0, y1, y2, y3, and insist that we have these relations, and they're just obtained from uh, the columns uh, of this matrix here, okay, then the effect uh, of the algebra is that if we replace the x zeros, x1, x2, and so on by these expressions here, we plug into this equation here, then everything uh, changes, and the new equation that we get is essentially uh, this one here, 13y0 plus 4y0y1 plus 5y0y2 plus 3y0y2 to the 12th, y3 to the 14th equals 0, corresponding to this power matrix. That's the basic idea, row reduction, allowing us to transform our equation into a simpler equation. And then now if we're looking for solutions of this, well, things are much, much simpler because the y1 term, for example, only occurs in one place. All right, so basically, as long as the y0 is uh, not zero, you can let y2 and y3 be anything that you want, and you can then solve for y1. And so you get an explicit parameterization of all the solutions. So that's the basic idea of, uh, of this method. And there's, a, I guess, a general principle here that instead of looking for solutions of a particular equation, what we're thinking is let's transform this equation in as flexible a way as we can, and in the space of all equivalent equations, let's try to search for one that's of a particularly simple kind. Now this method uh, doesn't always work, of course. It will depend on the matrices. It will basically depend on how effective row reduction is in simplifying the power matrix of the equation. And it's not too hard to see that the equations that are least susceptible to this method, in other words, the ones that are hardest to deal with with this idea, are the ones of Fermat type, where the exponents are all pretty well the same, for example. And there's very little interaction between the, uh, the rows of this matrix, no possibilities for a row reduction to simplify things. So in some sense, we see that the Fermat type of equations are in some sense the, uh, the most difficult kinds of equations from this point of view. In terms of further directions, there's a lot of, uh, I can think, natural questions in terms of how often does this method work? How effective actually is it? If you give a random a prime and give a sort of a random equation, how likely is it that this method will allow you to uh, solve the uh, system completely? And there's another sort of general uh, direction, that, which is uh, these kinds of transformations are of a very particular kind. Right? We're basically only using power substitutions. We could also think about more in general polynomial substitutions, replacing one set of variables with another, which would give us a lot more flexibility in terms of transforming an equation to something simpler. Of course, that, then the job would be uh, much more difficult, and I don't really know how to say anything about that particular situation. But anyway, I do claim that this is a pretty powerful technique that works especially effectively uh, when the we're working over a finite field, but in fact it also, as I mentioned in my paper, can work and help you when you're solving diophantine equations over the rationals. Thanks.